All right, now we are going to tackle a a uh, genre that you're all familiar with, the uh, inspiring teacher movie. Everybody has seen at least probably two or three of these. For sure. <laughs> um, where it goes, there's well, there's there's kind of different sets of them, but most of them involve like the inner city type, like like Stand and Deliver is, and like Dangerous Minds, and Lean on Me, and going all the way back. I think this whole genre itself goes all the way back at least to Blackboard Jungle, mm -hmm. um, which is amazing if you can find it. Um, which is pro it's probably the best one there's ever been. So make sure you look for that. Um, but given that this is our uh, tribute month. Our second tribute month. Um, I knew that something had to go against Dead Poets Society, and it was going to be an inspiring teacher movie. And this is just kind of the one I settled on. Um, but we're going to start with Dead Poets Society, actually, um, where I'm pretty sure anybody watching this video is watching this video because they have seen Dead Poets Society, and I won't be saying anything new if I go into too much detail about what the actual story is. But, if for some reason you haven't, um, spo uh, spoilers galore for starters, just warning you now. <laughs> um, and secondly, um, let's, uh, let's just go into this. Um, the secondly would be me telling you what the plot is. <laughs> um, we have the, um, we're in one of those, um, prep schools where it's, we have our, our group of students that are friends that we kind of are involved with who are um, there's a few familiar faces in this that got more popular and a few that just kind of faded the the popular faces you probably know are um, our, our main focus point is Neil who is Robert Sean Leonard and then there is um, Ethan Hawke and Josh Charles uh, jo Josh Charles just kind of just kind of sneaks in there Robert Sean Leonard and Ethan Hawke have done a lot of movies together since then but sure. um, Yes, and then we have our um, our other people who we'll go into uh, in a minute, and the new a new teacher uh, is now on board who is John Keating, who is Williams's character, who is a poetry teacher who obviously has unorthodox methods like they do always, <laughs> um, and teaches them in, in about poetry in a way they had never fathomed before, but also in general, how to take on life in a way that they can do pretty much anything they desire to in, under the right circumstances. Um, and just be free to not be pushed in a direction by another force of sorts. Um, and Williams' performance is really, really something that holds this together. It's very interesting. Um, obviously, he's the he seems like he's the main focal point of the movie. He's got the name above and everything. Um, he, this was one of his, this was his second Oscar nomination uh, in leading actor, and it's generally considered a leading performance. But really, it's a supporting role. It's actually it's one of those performances where it just takes a hold of the movie so well, and just really, really sticks in your brain, and the the character just makes such an impact on you. You kind of forget how little he's actually in it. And how uh, the boys are the main focus, um, partic particularly Robert Shaw Leonard's character. Um, now, the thing about it is, there are, it's yeah, this isn't exactly a movie that you would jump to call original, despite the fact that um, it did win the Oscar for original screenplay as well as getting in for Williams, director and of course picture, um, one of Peter Weir's. Uh, director nominations that actually should have happened more than it has. <laughs> um, but the thing, because you know, you have, obviously it's an inspiring teacher movie. There have been, you know, many before. Stand and Deliver was the year before it. <laughs> um, and then Lean on Me was the same year, I think. Um, just, there's a whole lot. But of course, um, this one takes a different approach. But there's other stuff like um, the overbearing dad character played by Kerwood Smith, uh, we've seen in a lot of movies. But once again, this movie knows how to take and put it in a direction that we don't see very often, which is something else we'll get to soon. Um, the only time I feel the movie kind of slows down is uh, Josh Charles' storyline, where it basically, obviously with these boys, one of them has to be 
uh, exploring young love, and we have to go through that. It's, I mean, it's not, it's harmless. It doesn't really do anything to stop the story dead or anything, but it's the one aspect of the movie that I think kind of doesn't reach, doesn't really do anything to reach the heights that the rest of the portions of the movie do. Um, though Knox is really a supporting character anyway, so I get he doesn't this doesn't this doesn't necessarily have to have a profound effect on the story or anything, but. The thing about it, though, is it's one of those movies where we have our different students that we follow, where um, on top of the main three, we also have uh, Cameron, Charlie, Pitt, Pitts, and Meeks. Um, and normally you would think this would be one of those movies where we have our three main characters and then the other two are just kind of there as background to just kind of make comments every now and then. But everybody kind of gets um, their moment in the story and a, a very crucial scene to do, or moments. Like with C Cameron's the one that uh, they think everybody, that they think ratted out everybody who did, basically. Um, after uh, what happens with Neil, and then um, Charlie is the character who almost gets himself expelled because he does the prank with the phone call. And, because he's he's following Keating's advice, but not exact more so than he probably should be, and not in the way that he should be exploring it. Um, Pitts and Meeks are pretty much the closest thing we get to those background characters, but they still kind of the ones with the unfortunate names, as Keating puts it. <laughs> um, I mean, every, everybody, all the characters kind of have their little moments, and then we have um, some actresses in here who kind of went on to bigger things, like Melora Walters and Laura Flynn Boyle, uh, who just kind of hang around them, but they, but they they went on to other things. Um, now, the thing about here, when it takes off, when they start this club, is that this is really when it kind of takes it to a point to where the story starts to develop and we start to wonder. Well, the, the other people start to wonder, it kind of depends on who you are as an audience member, if you start to wonder if Kate's advice should be fully taken and how much or how little and how it could affect them negatively just as much as it could positively. It's kind of hard to say, which is the beauty of the movie because it kind of shows from both perspectives. Uh, more so than it gets credit for, from what I'm understanding. Um, there is a whole array of memorable scenes in it. The, um, the famous, obviously, it's redundant to even say, the Seize the Day line, when he's, they're looking over the pictures and he's whispering as if it's the spirits telling them to seize the day and make their lives extraordinary. Inspirational stuff like that that people have been quoting for years now. <laughs> uh, for good reason, by the way. Um, there's the moment that comes back later where Keating kind of teaches them to stand on the desk and just, you know, take the world by storm. Another, one scene that I really love that stands out, maybe it's because I relate to Hawk's character in this case, <laughs> is, um, they're given an assignment on Friday and the following Monday they have to, they have to write a poem and read it in front of the class. There's no, there's really no particular guidelines. It's just write a poem you have to read in front of the class when you come back. <laughs> um, and he knows immediately that even Hawk's character is not taking to this, and that is just not his thing. He can't write a poem on the fly, and he sure as shit can't read it in front of the class. <laughs> so it's this fantastic scene where Keating brings him to the front of the class, and he's not written anything. And Keating manages to conjure these emotions out of him to where he just comes up with something on the fly, and it just it just pours out of him and like instinct and it's a really really great scene and really shows um how powerful both the character and how he affects them can be um talking about um what happens with neil now um the thing about it is the movie kind of gets a little there are moments where the movie has been accused of being a bit sentimental. Um, I kind of struggle to see that, given this movie's ending. Because despite... The thing about it that most people don't really talk about is... Because the the ending is so triumphant, in a way, that you also kind of almost forget... the Because the ending is so powerful, you almost kind of forget how really bleak the movie is, too. 
Because it is it is inspiring to an extent, but it, the bleakness might be more so. Because what has happened here with this character? Um, like I said, you think you know the character of the overbearing dad. Um, but then there's the way this movie plays it, where... Neil decides that he wants to become an actor, and he actually gets the role of Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to him. It's, he finally realizes what he wants to do with his life, and he's never been more alive, and everything is great. Um, the trouble is, is that his dad absolutely will not do the acting. He will not embarrass the family by doing such a thing. He'll become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever the fuck he wants. Um, but he is not to do acting, which is the one thing that he really wants to do. So, with Keating's advice, Len or, Sean Leonard decides that he is going to go ahead and do the play. And naturally, while he is performing the play, his dad shows up and is at the back of the auditorium. In any other movie, especially inspirational movies, this is the moment where the dad watches his son perform... And everybody stands up and applauds, and then, which happens, <laughs> and then the dad goes backstage and says, oh my god, this is what you want to do, these are your people, this is, this is what you should do, this is what makes you happy. That is not the direction they take. Um, his father grabs him by the arm and drags him out away from his friends and puts him in the car and drives him home and says, this will never happen again. This is just absolutely not it. And now, you maybe can criticize, and you can maybe see this as coming out of nowhere, but if you watch Robert Feldman's performance, which is really impressive, you kind of get a sense that there's something inside of him to where this didn't necessarily come from out of nowhere, especially the scene where he's already told Keating that he can't talk to his dad about this, and that if he does, it's just going to go nowhere. It's going to be like talking to a brick wall. Um... But he takes Keating's advice and he goes and he talk and he well he doesn't talk to his dad about it. But he comes back and tells Keating that he took his advice and says my dad's not happy about it, but I'm gonna he's gonna let me do the play anyway. And the way he performs, you can tell number one he's heartbroken. That's not actually the case. And number two, you can really tell that he's lying. Um, <laughs> and there's is there something in that scene that kind of makes what happens um, not as surprising. Of course, once Neil is really shut down by his dad and is told that he will never act again and he can't do that, instead of standing up for his dad, standing up to his dad and doing what he wants, whether anybody likes it or not, it's way too overwhelming for him and he commits suicide. <laughs> um, and it is at this point where, you re number one, you're starting to wonder, having not seen it, uh, where the inspiring part comes in, right? <laughs> well, the thing about it is the reason, because Cameron ratted them out and everybody is just kind of forced into doing this, um, the blame is put on Keating. Because nobody can possibly think that it was his dad's pushing him that put him there. They just think he was sick and Keating basically put him up to doing things that he could not do. And that's what pushed him to it. Um, and gets Keating fired. And the last scene of the movie, there's no, there's nothing, there's no big stand against the overbearing nature. There's no Keating getting his job back. It's just, they stand on the desks and they let him know how he has changed them and how they will, even if it doesn't get them anywhere, they'll still stand up for what they believe in and stand up for him. Um, for what he gave them. They're kind of giving this back to him in return. And the last scene of the movie is him thanking them and leaving. So, there is definitely something inspirational in there, but it's kind of mind-boggling that people can jump to the term sentimental. <laughs> because there's a whole lot of bleakness underlying in that uh, inspiring notion, to me anyway. Um, so... Yes, it is an extremely powerful movie. Um, Jimmy Fallon did a nice thing where when he did um, when he did his tribute to Williams on The Tonight Show, uh, it ended with him standing on his desk um, as a tribute to this movie. And yeah, it, it definitely is one of his 
more impactful performances and one of the ones people really jump to for quotes also um because it's just one of those movies uh this is this is the movie that like football teams quote to get <laughs> upon before a game and shit like that um and it, there's definitely a reason why it has that reputation that it does now and i it surprises me the cr the critics did not take to it near as much as audiences or the academy did um which is interesting to me they they just kind of blew it off as this kind of in another long line of these i guess um, but there's definitely something about it that stands out and makes it different. And I'm, gl I'm glad the Academy realized that. Um, all those nominations, it it's fantastic that it got. And that win. <laughs> um, and of course, the young performances. There's a reason that, especially Ethan Hawke, we see a lot nowadays. We see Ethan Hawke like five times a year now. <laughs> and it's great. It's awesome. Unless it's Getaway. It's great. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, there's a reason that movie has the reputation that it does. Um, Seen and Deliver is probably a lesser known one, though also an Oscar nominated one. Edward James almost did get a Best Actor nomination for this, his only one so far. Um, and this one, this one's actually a true story uh, for the most part. I think the guy that uh, almost plays said that the movie is 90% accurate. So um, apparently he was a big fan. He said it was 90% accurate, 10% drama. Um, which is, which is pretty much as close as you get in a true story. Usually they're just fabricated to hell. <laughs> um, but here we have this story of, um, he's this, he's this teacher who's just transferred here and he's under the impression that he's going to be teaching computers. The trouble is, is they were supposed to get the computers two years ago and they still haven't because the school is just that run down and out of its budget. Um, so he's stuck teaching calculus to them. And he's basically preparing them for this exam that's pretty much impossible uh, in hopes that all 18 of them can get past it. Uh, the trouble is, of course, is that only pretty much only one of them, maybe two of them, actually want success. The others are just totally uninterested, or they have other things going on in their life, or they're just complete slackers. The story we've always seen, of course. But... Um, once again, this one is obviously you can tell the realism is there, where it's actually this actually is ninety percent something that actually happened. Um, but the really the main selling point of the movie is almost his performance, and what's so great about it is this is one of those characters where you could tell he could have gone totally over the top and been almost like a cartoon character because he's he's just really really out there, mm -hmm. but. There's something about him where he he actually adds a human quality to a character that is so boisterous in what he does. Um, but his, what's also great about that is there's also a huge sense of humor about him to where normally in these roles, um, the character. This is another thing that people love about Keating. I think is generally in these uh, inspiring teacher roles, the roles are a little too stoic. Like they're there's somebody that's like on this huge pedestal that's just like. Uh, I will straighten all of you out from up here with my godlike powers, and then I will. I'm getting mixed up because Morgan Freeman's and Leon. Me, that's why <laughs> I jumped to that. <laughs> but, um, but this is a character that's just really his unorthodox methods are borderline goofy, but just the way he's able to win them over um, is totally believable with this character and just how he's flushed out. Um, and there's it's just one of those things where it's not it doesn't. It also helps that it doesn't descend the story into something that's too... Obviously, it's a serious story, but it's not something that really kind of descends into something that's really almost soap opery, which is something it really could have done. But the character keeps that from happening. Um, and he has... He doesn't even really have big scenes. It's just kind of the whole point. The closest he gets to a big scene is when he's fighting with Andy Garcia about whether or not they all cheated, because they all... They all finished around the same time, and they all missed the same questions, but they all passed. So Andy Garcia is under the impression that they all cheated, clearly. So he has to have them retake it. Um, despite the fact that it was apparently just a huge coincidence, and pot potentially um, something that he taught wrong is why they all got the same questions wrong. Um, there's kind of a hint at that, but they don't really go into it. But... Um, then obviously the main teacher, the main student we're looking at is Blue Diamond Phillips, as you can tell by the poster. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
where you wouldn't think that Edward James almost was the star of this movie. <laughs> no, <laughs> you wouldn't. Um, but I think he was also a producer on, if I remember correctly. Um, Ludwig Phillips is basically the main student we're kind of focusing on, and he's the guy who he wants to learn, but there's things holding him back. Like he doesn't want his friends to know that he's learning, or he could get his ass kicked or his book mm. stolen. Um, and we learn that he comes off like a slacker through the whole movie, but then about halfway through, we realize that he's taking care of his family and he's actually holding up other responsibilities that make it seem like he's just kind of walking away from school just voluntarily. Um, when he's actually just trying to maintain all the responsibilities in his life at once. And it's a, it's a really well-fleshed character. And Phyllis, Luna Phyllis is a really underrated actor. Um, he's been great in a lot of things, ranging from La Bamba to Courage Under Fire. To, I, I, his over-the-top villain in The Big Hit is one of my favorite things in the world. I mean, I know people don't like that movie, but I just... <laughs> uh, but, yeah, you, you've heard me talk about that movie. Yes. Um... But yes, I just love the way these characters are kind of put together. All the students kind of feel, they don't, they aren't like particular characters of different, you know, types. Uh, they're, they all just kind of feel like, they're, even though we don't really get to know most of them individually, they still feel like a classroom of real students that all kind of have their own thing going on. Um, and they're actually written that way also. Um, so it's... That's a really strong aspect of this movie, that other movies like this don't pull off very well. Um, now it's, and of course we have, obviously yes, the movie does reach a triumphant moment where uh, obviously they do all end up passing, naturally. Um, and then the, the scene at the end where we see the statistics where the next year more students pass it and then the next year more students pass it, all the way up to the, the year the movie came out. Um, which was about six years' time, I think, between, uh, where the numbers of students that passed it just kept rising as it went because of this program. Um, and that, that great moment where Phillips is the one that you really, really want to see succeed, and they're going through the scores that they got on the test, which are one through five, I think. Mm. Um, and it's, there's this nice montage where as the guy is reading off the scores, it cuts to the student. It shows, like, a clip of the student from the other scene to show you how they did and it gets to Phillips, and you know all this stuff was going on in his life, and he was just taking care of all this stuff. And even even the one girl that was, you know, really focused on success got a four. So you're kind of just, you're hoping he at least gets a three or four, because he's the guy that really, really struggled. And when they say five, just something is really rises out of you. Like, you're so, it's a really triumphant, it's a triumphant moment for all of them, but especially for him, and I think that's why he's often used as the focal point. Apparently, it's not as happy as the movie would suggest because it's one of those movies where, after the movie was released, stuff went down, and there was um like I guess he ended up having to leave and he went back to his home country and the program got shut down and it wasn't it wasn't quite a happily ever after kind of scenario but it was close enough. He still made a a big impact on quite a few lives enough to matter and definitely have a movie about it. So. Um, yes, that's another reason why this is seen as one of those really nice, triumphant teacher movies, but, um, Dead Poets Society all day long, for sure. <laughs> all right. So, I, I agree with most people who see the movie the way it is, and the Academy and everything, so, yeah. But Stand and Deliver does, you know, make an impact in itself, just not quite as a powerful one as Dead Poets Society. Even if Stand and Deliver is a true story, it kind of has the upper hand in regards to that, but there's something Dead Poets Society really accomplishes, especially with that underlying bleakness, how it's still able to make you feel like something inspiring has happened to you, so, yeah. So ends another edition of Robin Williams Versus, <clears throat> and uh, holy crap, when, when you see this video, it's only going to be a couple days before I'm in Orlando again. Mm -hmm. And the next time we do a Versus, which ironically enough is war, themed towards mm -hmm. last year's Bill and Ted, if you know what I'm talking about, for Halloween Horror Nights 24. Yeah, we're going to have some fun with that one. That one's <laughs> coming up uh, next Sunday. I will be out of town, obviously. You guys will be able to follow along with me here on Pop. With all my exploits, all the group and everything, our pop meetup coming up in a couple weeks, so uh, check that out. And uh, we will continue Versus and AJ's movie reviews 
on Friday and Sunday, so that's going to stay. You're still going to get AJ content, still going to get Ashley content. We're just not going to be live, so. That being said, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching. Once again, thank you for watching wrestling content. Thank you for watching Halloween Horror Nights content. I had a couple that were put up this past week. And uh, thank you for checking out the podcast because they're really uh, doing well right now when it comes to views. And that's pretty much what we've got for today. And uh, check us out, moviepilot.com backslash Sir Owen Disney. And if you have an iPhone, iPod, iPad, or any sort of iDevice, check us out, Sir Owen Disney, on iTunes. That's our pop mobile app. That being said, thank you guys and girls out there for watching. AJ, any parting words? 